we're going to be talking about resonance and the effects of damping, so different things like overdamped, underdamped, critically damped. Let's first of all, I think it's a good way to start with uh, this brilliant comic by XKCD. I like this new, excuse me, you're jiggling your leg up and down and she's traveling through the floor and making my desk resonate. Oh, I didn't realize, I'll stop. It's like, actually, can you just shift the frequency up by 15%? I think you can get resonance with Steve's desk instead. He's like, uh-huh, and here are the calculations. Let's try to spill his drink. But actually, it has to do with this. So any system, or at least many systems, uh, they can oscillate at what's called a natural frequency. It's at the frequency at which it will readily vibrate. So this is assuming though there's no friction, that there's no damping, okay? So lots of different things can vibrate. For example, um, greenhouse gases, for example, those gases can vibrate at a certain natural frequency. And that's why actually those, um, you know, light, infrared light, for example, from the sun can come in. It turns out that gives it the exact amount of energy it needs to vibrate. So for example, those ones vibrate at a natural frequency. That's why they can heat up the atmosphere. Well, lots of things can have a natural frequency. If I just took a mass on a spring, and I just let it go, it's going to oscillate at a natural frequency. And what will that be? Well, it depends on the system. So for example, what if we want to figure out, hey, what is the natural frequency for a spring mass system? You might think, oh God, do we have an equation like that in our data booklet? No. How are you going to do it? Well, you just have to remember one important fact. Remember, that frequency and period are inversely proportional. In other words, we have T equals 1 over F. You have to remember that. So let's think about this. Do we know then uh, how to get from F if we know T? Of course we do. We can just say, therefore, um, let's write it down like this. Therefore, F equals just 1 over the period. Well, do we know the period for a spring mass system? We actually do. For a spring mass system, we have T equals 2 pi m over k, and that one is in a square root. This is in your formula booklet, or a data, bu um, data booklet, sorry, so is this. So because of that, then I'm just going to take my frequency and just do 1 over this. So you notice then, and we often call it f0. We often call it like natural frequency. is often called f with a little 0, means like natural frequency here. By the way, this is in hertz. So if we look at this one here then, f0 then will just be, well, 1 over this 2 pi root uh, m over k. Now, what happens then? Well, I can keep going then. I can say that f is 0 equals 1 over 2 pi. That's true. Uh, but then I can say then that this here, the k comes on top. So it's going to be actually k over m square root. Just because I've divided by a fraction means I have to multiply by the reciprocal. So I could actually say, for example, hey, the natural frequency for spring mass system will be like this. You could figure out the same kind of thing for a pendulum. Just use the pendulum equation instead, so 2 pi times square root of L over G, and just do 1 over that. So you see how you can actually figure out lots of things, even if you don't think you can. Even though there's no formal you know, uh, equation for it, you can actually work it out yourself. So let's go a little bit deeper into resonance. So what happens with resonance is if you have a driving frequency, that what I mean by that is it's something where you're actually hitting it. Or something you're forcing this this time well if we look at the amplitude of something and you look at you know where you're driving it so if you're hitting it at you know a certain frequency it's too low okay fine but when you reach when you hit it at a driving frequency that is its natural frequency then you can cause the amplitude to go up so this happens you know if you're just yeah you're driving something in other words you're artificially hitting it or vibrating it at a way such that it's exactly at its natural frequency what happens then the amplitude of the wave will increase now this can be good, it can be bad, it depends on what you want to do with it. For example, this is a bridge, a famous bridge in uh, Vancouver called the Capilano Bridge. But if you've ever actually been there, as you're walking on it with different people, it turns out if everyone's actually walking in step, and if you're stepping fairly slowly, you'll actually feel like you know the bridge start to vibrate. Well, it would be pretty bad, wouldn't it, if everyone was walking at the exact natural frequency? What they often do with bridges, they usually, uh, engineers are very clever about this, they can calculate the natural frequency of a bridge and make sure that it's nothing close to what it'll actually be hit at. So in other words, if people are walking on it, or if wind is hitting it or something like that, then that'll be actually okay. With sound, for example, uh, I've seen this really great, you know, um, slow motion things are here. So like a glass, for example, that if you hit, uh, if you, you know, you can figure out what's the resonant frequency of glass, of a particular glass. And if you then have like a speaker that's right beside it, that you just crank that up, you know, at that actual uh, 
driving frequency, you hit it right at its natural frequency, it'll actually create standing waves in this uh, glass. Can you see them? They're sort of vibrating. You can see they're going whoa, 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 like that. And of course, sometimes the amplitude is so much, it actually can break. So that can be bad, I guess. But sometimes it's a good thing, like the microwave light, that's just light in a very specific wavelength, has a tendency to excite water mo molecules. That's because it hits them at their natural frequency, and when the water molecules move around, they heat up. So that serves a good purpose. It means it heats up the microwave. So in other words, heats up the food in the microwave, as long as the food has some water in it. Do you notice, by the way, if you have just a plate, and you put the plate in a microwave, for example, with nothing else on it, most plates will actually still remain cold. People are like, why is that? Well, that's because there wasn't much water in there to actually excite and to vibrate at its natural frequency. Because that, the plate actually remained fairly cool. But if you put like water in there or some food that has you know a fair bit of you know H2O in it, so water, then of course it'll heat up. That works very well. So let's talk about damping. Damping is what happens when you do have friction. So, uh, and what that will do is it'll cause the vibrations to have less amplitude over time. So let's look at an example here. First of all, no damping. That means, you know, if we have nothing actually going on, there's no friction. Well, then your wave might start like this at the top and go like this right here. So I'm just trying to draw something with a constant amplitude. I'm trying to at least. You notice this height here is supposed to be the same. Now, if you do have some damping, so some friction in the system, uh, we, we have something called underdamped, that means like, yes, it will slow it down, so to speak, it'll make the amplitudes to be less and less and less, and maybe it goes like this, you know, maybe something like that, then it goes to zero. That could be the case, that's underdamped. What if it's overdamped? What that means is this thing right here, there's so much friction, it basically just goes like, yeah, it doesn't even, doesn't even do a whole oscillation, it never reaches zero, it just sort of stops. That could be overdamped. Now, of course, critically damped, that's a neat one, that's actually one where it just goes down like this and goes right away, just right to zero. So a critically damped system is actually the fastest way to get there. Do you notice like it's the quickest way to get to zero amplitude? Overdamped, it didn't even get to do one oscillation. It didn't even get to zero. It was just like so damped, it just, it just stopped moving. That could be like if you have like a pendulum and it's got so much friction, you let it go, and it just goes, eh. it doesn't even go back to zero. It doesn't even go back to equilibrium here at zero displacement. So that could be the case. So something like this right here is really important. Now let's talk about driving frequency and what are the effects of damping. So we have something that we can call forced resonance, but with no damping. So just to remind you again, if we have this you know, driving frequency here and we're hitting it at its natural frequency, then of course we make the amplitude go up. I'm just reminding you of that curve. Remember, that's what we did over here. Okay, so what happens then is the different types of damping, what does that do actually to the amplitude? So if we have this driving frequency, what does that do to the amplitude? Well, if we have zero damping, it might do something like this. Now, if we have a little bit more damping, so I don't know, maybe something like, uh, so some damping, it'll start here. And then the peak will maybe be like, I don't know, here maybe, something like that. And then if we had like, even more damping, then it'll actually maybe cause it to be something like this right here. So do you notice a few things happening here? The peak is going down, and it's also going to the left. Do you notice that? So this one right here, this peak, you know, this, this resonant frequency right here, this, what I can call F0, what does it do? It causes that to go as you get more and more damping. So maybe I'll write it like this. I'll say, um, I'll say light, you know, damping, for example. If I say light damping, that'll be the yellow one. And then I can maybe say, you know, even more damping, maybe I'll say that. I mean, of course, if you have too much damping, you just stop everything from happening. So that's why. I just want to show you, though, the effect that it has. You need to know about this. So something like this right here, maybe I'll get rid of uh, this one, and I'll get rid of this one right here. So what happens to that peak? As you increase damping, the peak goes down, and it goes left. Okay, so that's what the peak does. So what can we say? As damping increases, the amplitude decreases. So that's why, so that's why it goes down. And the frequency of the mac, uh, maximum amplitude gets smaller. That's the one where it goes this way. You see, that's to explain what happens to the peaks here. So the 
you know, qualitative effects are no damping, fine. You know, you just hit it right at its resonant frequency, everything's good. If you have a little bit of damping, sure, the amplitude will be less, but it's interesting. It actually shifts the uh, natural frequency. So in other words, the place where there's a maximum amplitude here, it'll change its maximum amplitude to the left as well as down. And as you get more and more damping, it goes more down and more left, you know? So the peaks go down and left as you increase damping. So we've looked at the effects of resonance, for example. So natural frequency, that's the frequency at which something will vibrate by itself. You can also, of course, have resonance if you give it a driving frequency that's at its natural frequency. You cause the amplitude to get bigger. Of course, damping can do the opposite. It makes the amplitude get smaller. We've got underdamped, overdamped, and critically damped. And we learned about the effects, what it does to the peak. It brings it down and left as you increase the damping.